Hi, everyone. My name is Justin Lebrec, and I'm an engagement manager at MongoDB. What that means practically is it's my job to help figure out how MongoDB can help different customers. And I work regularly with Cisco to uh, not only help uh, make projects a success, but figure out how MongoDB can really help Cisco from the design standpoint on next steps. So today we're going to be talking about patterns and simplifying design. When we talk about patterns, a lot of people think about relational databases. So I'm going to be using examples from things like Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, the traditional relational databases that people understand and have a lot of background on, and how those design principles relate directly to uh, new technology like MongoDB. So the goals, what is a design pattern and why do we use them? So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna go into methodology. What is the methodology of choosing a pattern and how do we figure out how design can impact things like performance? What are an example, uh, what are some example use cases? How does that work from a implementation methodology standpoint? And then finally, applying patterns. What are the patterns that we typically see in a MongoDB document style database? How do we use that to ex uh, extend time? Uh, Make timelines faster. How do we get those different uh, methodologies engaged in the projects that you do on a daily basis? So let's dive right in. So first off, what is a pattern? Well, most people, when they think about patterns, think about this book. This book is uh, called the Gang is by some a group of people called the Gang of Four, and it was originally designed to talk about software design patterns, how it is that software should be designed in the modern world using object-oriented programming. And it got abstracted to things like design patterns in databases, which is going to be our focus today. When we talk about patterns, we can make a real parallel to schema design, and we're going to do that. However, also when we talk about patterns, we need to remember that patterns are not full solutions. Patterns are guidelines and rules of thumb to make your life easier and to make projects go faster. Ultimately, they're common units of engineering work that allow projects to proceed quickly without having to worry about reinventing the wheel. So in order to talk about what patterns are, we need to know what a pattern is. So my team, as well as other teams within MongoDB have been spending the past 14 years on the document model, trying to figure out what patterns make the most sense and how do we make development go faster? So we're gonna be sharing that knowledge today. That knowledge comes from a common language of data architects and engineers so that when data architects, database engineers and software developers work together, they have a common framework to speak. When we say something like the bucket pattern, that should mean the same thing to a data architect as it does to a developer. So that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about a pattern is a common framework and methodology for those conversations. So what can a pattern actually do? Well, um, it's ultimately to get development started. And when we're talking about development, we're talking about things like improved performance. Patterns are a repeatable and well-defined way of getting good performance out of your applications. There's simplicity of data access. One thing that dramatically changes when you're moving from a relational database like Oracle to a MongoDB style database, a document database, is the way that your data can be stored. In a relational database, you really only have one way of doing things, and that's rectangular or square. In a document model database, you have much more flexibility because you have things like arrays and you have things like objects and sub objects. So because of that, we want to simplify the access of the data and the access patterns so that the application has what it needs when it needs it. This is dramatically different than using something like an ORM, an object relational mapper, to translate from a relational database that square format into a uh, object used by developers everywhere. So there are some caution, uh, cautionary points that I want to bring up. And when we talk about design patterns, and specifically the gang of four, you might have heard of something called the third normal form. Well, in relational databases, you really have uh, no other choice, right? You can denormalize, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But in modern methodologies of schema patterns, Data duplication, which previously had been something to avoid, might actually be something worth pursuing. 
So for example, let's say that you have an invoice and that invoice has uh, an address associated with that. In third normal form, if you change that address in one invoice, it changes for all of the invoices. And that might not be desirable, especially if you want to go back and reprint an old invoice or something like that. So duplication of data is something that we've historically been cautioned against, but might make a little bit more sense. When we talk about patterns, there are trade-offs that are going to be involved. Some of this has to do with staleness of data. Can the application consume uh, stale data? And that comes with things like pre-calculated fields. And then finally, we have denormalization, which I mentioned just a bit ago. Denormalization is a key opportunity to improve performance. Now that sounds odd coming from the third normal form realm, but in the modern kind of development schema, there are a lot of ways of uh, iterating around the problems of data denormalization, and we'll focus on that in a moment. These are some of the patterns that have been identified by MongoDB and working with customers worldwide. This is, again, a rule of thumb. It does not mean that all uh, catalogs need to use the attribute pattern. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but this should be a good reference for the future. So let's dive into the methodology. We've talked about what are patterns. Now let's talk about how do we actually use these things. Well, there's a spectrum. And when we're designing anything in uh, computing, we have to balance performance with simplicity. Ideally, we can get simplicity and performance as a goal. Uh, MongoDB thankfully provides a mixture of that simplicity and performance for most uh, early release projects. So it allows developers to focus on the simplicity with performance automatically following. Um, when the software becomes more complex over time, however, because of features or because of additional requirements, complexity tends to grow. When complexity tends to grow, performance seems to suffer because you're adding additional code, simplified code, that has a cost associated with that change. But companies need to grow and companies need to scale. So we need to consider that during our design process. How do we actually find a balance? Where do we find, instead of simplicity and instead of focusing on just performance, where is that middle ground? And the methodology that I'm about to present is designed to help you find that middle ground. So when we talk about methodology, we have some inputs. And those are the inputs that you see on the screen today. There are certain scenarios and use cases that your application is going to be uh, leveraging in this new design. There's going to be logs and statistics, things that need to be collected. There also might be business domain experts, right? A person in the organization that has the knowledge uh, required to get to the next steps. So we take all of these inputs, uh, these inputs for the first part of the methodology, which is describe the workload. In relational databases, a lot of times, data design has to come first. You only have one way to represent data, so that comes first, and then the application will adapt to the design because you have one choice for design. In terms of MongoDB and other document-related databases, we're kind of flipping that backward. We're saying that the workload is really what defines the queries, and the queries are defined what the data schema should look like and the access patterns. So here, we have our inputs. We can figure out basic things and some assumptions. We get things like queries and indexes, you might get data sizes and operations. Well, from there, we now need to identify relationships. And so far, we're being very relational in our methodology, but we started with workloads first. So now that we're introducing identifying models and relationships, we're talking about the standard relationships of data. You might have one person that has multiple addresses or multiple phone numbers. You might have multiple addresses applied to multiple people. So those types of relationships still hold true but we're starting to get a little bit deeper into the design process. Finally, when we talk about patterns, this is the most unique part about the patterns that we're gonna be introduce introducing today, is we go from this square rectangular model, which is the first two workload and relationships, now to applying the dynamic ability to apply patterns and make things go faster. So we have a use case that we're gonna go through very quickly. Essentially, I created an insurance portal. And this insurance portal, allows us to talk about different requirements, right? Identifying requirements, the first part of our goal. Workload, what is our workload? Our workload might also have a list of requirements, and I've put some requirements up on the screen, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna be moving very quickly through these, but we also have quantifications, and some of these quantifications might be actually relatively difficult to achieve. So for example, less than two milliseconds, if we're going to be doing 12 reads a second, and a million reads per day, that means that we have less than two, two milliseconds for each of these different uh, requirements and important types of queries. 
So now that we've identified our workload, we actually look at the entities themselves, right? This is now the second part of our process. We talked about workload. Now we're going to talk about the uh, data relationship. Given that set of requirements, we can start to look at our needs. We know that there are going to be a set of users. It's insurance. So we're going to talk about policies and claims. There are going to be bills associated with that. There might also be documents like things that need to be signed and scanned and sent back. There might be messages between the organization and their customers. So we've identified these entities, and this is where the relationship dramatically changes in the document model. We have something like this. Now, this might be a little bit odd coming from a relational standpoint because we have a user kind of meta object that contains other things like policies, claims, billing, et cetera. So this is now where we go into the final step, which is applying patterns. Now, when we look at applying patterns, use case does come first. So we're going to take a look back at our actual requirements and then derive from there. So from the requirements standpoint, we can start beginning to move parts of our process together. We've already identified workload. We've already identified some basis of relationship. But now we can be very iterative. We know that there are patterns that we can use. So let's combine some of that relationship process to figure out our spectrum between simplicity and performance. We don't want to just focus on design. We don't want to just focus on the relationships. We need to consider simplicity and performance in order to determine what patterns make the most sense. And this is where we start actually getting into the crux of the different options. So I'm going to quickly introduce some patterns. The first one is the computed pattern. When does the computed pattern make sense? The computed pattern is essentially a stored calculated value. You might be able to think about this as a materialized view in relational world. You might think of this as kind of a, a application pre-calculated value that gets stored in its own table. This is essentially useful when we have lots of different readers for something that happens infrequently like writes. So what we're doing is we're offloading a lot of our work. Instead of doing a sum every time that we need to do a read, well, that's going to take a lot of work for the database. The database has to go and find many, many rows, and it has to sum values together. And if we're doing that significantly more than we're doing writes, well, we're doing a lot of work, right? And that work ultimately comes back to simplicity versus performance. We're now sacrificing performance. So let's sacrifice a little bit of simplicity by using the computed pattern. What this does is it offloads a lot of our reading requirements to a single document or a single row. We essentially pre-sum values and store them in the computed format, which is why it's called the computed pattern. Now, when we actually need to go and read this back, that data is available in one row, one document. And that means that transferring data over the wire should be very insignificant, very small. So you're going to get great performance from the network standpoint. There is no calculations that the database has to go and figure out. There are no rows that need to get summed. So you gain a lot of database time there. And then finally, when it comes to the read perspective, all you have to do is display a number on the screen. That number is already part of the document because what we did was we offloaded our writes and did an additional write whenever we needed to calculate a value. So you might be writing um, a, a, um, a bill, for example, in our insurance example. If you have a payment come in, we can either, when we need to display an invoice, sum up all of the different payments and figure out what the outstanding balance is, or we just have it ready and we have it pre-computed so that when you do a payment, you go and record the payment in one domain and then you go record the calculated value in another. So we're sacrificing simplicity by adding additional rights. This is the crux of applying patterns, is these pre-existing, predefined methodology or predefined patterns for our methodologies will allow us to really make things go faster so we don't have to come back later and then figure out how to make things more performant at the cost of simplicity, right? We can combine that simplicity, or we can combine that uh, pattern usage and the data relationships part of our methodology to make things go faster. I'm going to introduce another pattern. There's something called the extended reference pattern. Now, this is what typically uh, gets called denormalization. 
Denormalization, as I mentioned, might be a cautionary tale. A lot of organizations are used to avoiding denormalization. And there are some reasons for that. But in kind of the modern paradigm, if we're looking between performance and simplicity, again, we might want to sacrifice some simplicity early on to get good performance. So you don't have to come back and make these optimizations in production, which are really difficult to do, right? It's much harder to do production changes than it is to do early in development. The extended reference pattern is the idea that you're keeping data where it's needed. And when we talk about keeping data where it's needed, we now talk about things like keeping data updated in various areas. We are denormalizing to increase read performance, but we're also not suggesting use lookups or joins. In a relational format, you only have a square. That means that you have to be doing joins. So here we're talking about extending data and a picture might help this out. This is the example I used earlier about an invoice. We might be keeping a, an address with an order so that if you need to change an address in the future, it doesn't necessarily have to change everywhere. But if you're pulling up an order, you want the address right away. So having that data available to the application is very beneficial. I mentioned our users collection earlier and the users collection is going to have a bunch of stuff in it. So this is what it will look like now that we've applied two of the patterns. We see our extended reference, we see our computed value. And we can combine these together. We have both computed and extended reference. How do we actually update it? This is what this looks like. And again, I'm moving very quickly through this for the sake of time. When we talk about actually computing values, the computation becomes very, very simple. Instead of having to figure out a total sum, say you owed 18,000, you subtract different payments to get 800, we now actually just have a payment value. I'm gonna introduce the bucket pattern. The bucket pattern is essentially an array. It's a single domain object made of multiple documents. And again, a picture is worth a thousand words. So this is what we have in a traditional relational format, and we're combining it within a bucket pattern to keep things together. So as we continue using these patterns, the bucket is very useful for keeping related pieces of information together. Well, we've already looked at one collection. Let's look at policies. Here we have an array, a bucket of different policies. Now, the great thing about this is whenever you query a policy, you now have multiple policies available to you. So instead of combining different rows, you're all set with one piece of data. Now, this is the bucket pack, uh, pack pattern in action. We've combined multiple patterns in order to get us where we need to be between simplicity and performance. We get excellent performance by adding an array that doesn't dramatically uh, reduce simplicity. Finally, we talk about outlier patterns, right? What happens as we add things to an array? That array might become unbounded, and that would be awful, right? We don't want a 16 megabyte document going over the wire. So there has to be a middle ground somewhere. The outlier pattern is the idea that we're focusing on 80% of the use case, but we also need to then go back and figure out the other 20%. So implement for the 80% use case and then go optimize for the 20%. Now, this can be a very, very data-driven decision. So when do you use bucket? When do you use outlier? Well, if we have basic data, we can make these decisions. Your decision should be data-driven. We have a maximum size of a bucket, and that should generally be figured out by your histogram. And then we have outliers. So when do you use a bucket pattern and when do you use an outlier? You can use this data to determine which of those patterns would make the most sense. In the bucket collection, in the bucket methodology, this is what it looks like. You have different claims inside of the documents, or you have different documents, rather, inside of a document's collection. But what is the maximum size of that bucket? And in this example, I'm using eight. So what do we do with the rest of those documents? Well, we overflow them. And this is where the overflow pattern comes into play, is we store the first batch of six in one document. We might store the second batch of six in another document. So we're essentially using the bucket pattern twice to calculate or to keep documents small, but still to have all the information we need. You can see that the ID references exactly what we're talking about. And here we have 10,000 as a policy number. Or we might have a collection called an overflow collection. And that collection would be where we put our overflow. So we might have a bucket that contains the first six documents, 60 documents, whatever that number needs to be. And then we have another collection that says outliers live here. So our 80% case, most of our histogram, we get our data right away because it's in one document. Outliers to that are then 
subsequent, less frequently accessed, and we go and use the outlier pattern to do that. How do you figure it out? Pick one. Right? You have this data-driven decision to help you move forward and choose which patterns make the most sense. So I know we were very, very fa fast through these different topologies and different options for you in terms of schema design, and there are many, many more. So we want to make sure that you get the takeaways, which are use the methodology, right? Use those three different steps to help simplify your life so that you don't have to go back and reinvent the wheel every time. We want to make sure that we're using common vocabulary so that the developers and the data architects all know what we're talking about. Are we talking about an overflow or a bucket? And then finally, patterns, plug and play. These patterns exist. They've been proven true and uh, exceedingly efficient in many, many use cases. And we wanna make sure that you get the benefit of those experiences. There is more information that we can provide to you on these topics. So if you would like to know more about the different patterns that exist, for example, what is the uh, polymorphism pattern? That's available at this blog. This presentation was originally designed by myself and Daniel Kruppel. Daniel Kruppel is a schema design expert at MongoDB, uh, who I work very closely with. So he helped build a blog series that can provide you with more information. And then if you're more curious about things like the bucket pattern and how that can be used in practical applications, I have a, a blog post called Paging with the Bucket Pattern. So thank you very much for your time and have a great rest of your day.